Um, Mark, I can't really turn the laptop around much to show you, but people here, as I said, we just got done watching the movie literally three minutes ago. Okay. Uh, thank you for agreeing to do this on such short notice. You just reached out to me by email like a few hours ago, and we got this all put together. Yeah, yeah, no worries at all. I've, I've done shorter notice than this, so that's cool. <laughs> all right. Well, I'm going to jump right into some questions that I had prepared. I'll read them off. Um, feel free to answer them as much as you want, and then we can take more questions from the audience uh, as I'll pause midway through. Okay. So one of the things the movie really highlights is the sense of community that the Flat Earth community has developed yep. of uh, really some really great uh, friendships that are made and all that. So what is yeah. your favorite part about the Flat Earther community? Uh, that. The, the friendships, the enthusiasm, by, by far, the, uh, when you're in, you know, it gener if once you're in it, we have such a massive retention rate, I think it's upwards of 99%, that that's the coolest thing, because it becomes this weird, eclectic family that uh, just keeps getting bigger and stranger, and, you know, we've had hundreds of regional meetups, and the meetups are so fun to do, and the conferences are a blast, you know, we've done them, you saw the Raleigh one, but after that we did Denver, yeah. and then this last year we did Dallas, and then in 2020, provided, you know, the virus doesn't wipe us all out, uh, <laughs> will be uh, Vegas in uh, October, ah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Definitely cool. the favorite part. All right. Uh how often do the smaller community meetups happen? Um, and you were flown out to one. How often does that happen? Uh, well? I don't get flown out to that many of them. But believe it or not, it was in the early, yeah, back in 2017, I was getting flown out to quite a few. But now they just, again, the enthusiasm runs so high that people, I mostly do promos. I mean, I've got a, a playlist on my channel that must have pushing 300 meetup pro promos from just about every state you can think of and, and some in the UK and some in countries that I don't know the language to. So yeah, there a lot, okay. hundreds, hundreds. But, but as far cool. as me being flown out to, not that many. The Pasadena one was special, but the documentary team wanted to make sure they were out there for it. Okay, cool. Yeah. All right, uh, moving on to my next question. Uh, getting more into the uh, flat earth model itself. Yeah. What is the most significant piece of evidence you know of that is in support of the flat earth model? And what, and what is, is the hardest piece of evidence that the flat earth model is really struggles to explain? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, both are very easy. Uh, the first one is something that they wasn't covered in the documentary. And I, I got to stress to anyone uh, out there that's listening that the director, by the time we got to the end of this thing, the director and the producers hated flat earth. Oh God, did they hate it so much. Um, and you can listen to that in the director's commentary. And I think the director's commentary is only on the iTunes version. And the reason why they hated it was, and you can, well, again, you just watched it, uh, was when that 12 year old kid walked up to the microphone at, at Raleigh and was asking me questions and literally they, they all unanimously, it's like, okay, yeah, this is when we had to take a stand against flat earth because, you know, we're, we're worried about, you know, it's all fun and games until the kids are involved. It's like, really, really? Cause we're not recruiting, you know, actively the kids. Anyway, sorry. So the most significant piece of evidence, I know you guys are getting thrown out in 45 minutes. Uh, <laughs> the most si significant piece of evidence, you know, supporting the, the flat earth model uh, would be something that's not talked about in the documentary, which is long distance photography. Uh, I know you guys will get to the laser test and the gyroscope test, but long distance photography. So if you're looking off into the distance, forget about side to side. If you're looking off into distance, the curvature of the earth, mainstream says, is eight inches per mile per mile which means that three miles is three times three times nine times eight is 72 inches and 10 miles is 800 inches. And if you go to 50 miles, it's pushing 1700 feet, give or take, which means the curvature should be blocking at least that much of whatever object you're looking at in the distance. And I didn't encourage people. There was, that was something I didn't even come up with where people were just running to the beaches and shooting objects at 30 and 50 and 100 miles off all, usually over a body of water and they could see these things but the, and basically what's changed is uh um hd technology in fact there's a wonderful video on my channel uh which is called this is an you know important flat earth video and that is we were shooting oil rigs off of santa barbara california one at six miles and one at 10 miles and we were only shooting i think about eight feet off the beach but what was interesting about that was it wasn't the the oil rigs themselves which we could see perfectly clearly that morning it was that the horizon was behind these objects. Well, that's impossible. Because remember, at, at those distances, we should be looking at at least 30 feet of curvature blocking these things off. But even if you discounted that, the horizon should never, ever, ever be behind them. And they were. 
Uh, the worst, the, 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 my least favorite thing about the flat earth, as far as proofs goes, is the Antarctic sun, which is, uh, if, if the North poles, that's easy because, you know, if we're living on some sort of dinner plate or building where the North poles, the center of, of the dinner plate, then, you know, doing a 24 hour sun around that, that's easy, but doing a 24 hour sun in Antarctica, that's really, really hard because the sun can't be, you know, in the same place for 24 hours. So we don't know what's going on there, but most of the time we don't have to worry about it because the Antarctic Treaty says that nobody can ever set up shop there ever, except for the military and military scientists. There you go. Mm -hmm. uh, going back to the first thing that you mentioned there, the seeing to the horizon and so forth. Yeah. I, I don't want to spend too much time talking about that, but that was something we actually discussed before the movie about how the height of various objects and you know you can prove with some pretty straightforward geometry what the height you should be able to see so do you mind if i send you some of that stuff later sure by all I, means like, please we already went over it in our room so oh I yeah yeah by, by all means i mean I've, I've looked at it for a number of years now but if whatever you got i'd love to see it okay cool all right uh next question is um about kind of the connection between what I guess I, I never, never really had to come up with a word for this before today, yeah. but I guess the disconnect between flat earthers and globists. I'm yeah. not sure uh, what to call Glo the other. Glo globalists is fine. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that there's a lot of very unnecessary hostility hmm. between the two groups. And I think that's one of the better points of the documentary is that people should treat each other with respect regardless of uh, various beliefs and the documentary highlights some people who lost connection with their families went through divorces because of their beliefs and yep. things like that lost all their friends yep but on the other side of that coin there were people who are very aggressively aggressively pushing flat earth agenda and I mentioned this in the email earlier yeah I didn't know about this until a couple days ago and someone brought it up to my attention but one of the other figures in the movie Nathan Thompson was arrested for harassing kids about it yep um, yeah. Which which part do you want to talk about first? Okay, so let's let's do this. The, yeah, the, the, I, just like on both sides. Okay, is I guess the part to talk about is what can both sides do to come to the discussion more level headedly. It's it's very very difficult because of what you called the disconnect. Or the short version is why do people get so mad at flat Earth? <laughs> you know, and and it's mostly because we're talking about a massive paradigm shift. Um, it almost goes into the the five stages of acceptance. You know, denial anger bargaining uh depression and and finally acceptance and that is and i and because i've done oh God, i can't i've lost count of how many interviews and people say why don't you get mad at the host the people that are talking to you because sometimes i get some really hostile questions and i say i can't because i used to be them uh back in 2015 i used to be people in the audience right now i mean i'm i, I could out geek any of you any day of the week Star Wars, Star Trek, St Stargate. I can tell you exactly why Doctor Who is crashing and burning right now. I can do that all day long. But, and so I love space and everything that was space. Um, the reason though why people get really, really mad at Flat Earth is kind of like the, the red pill, blue pill thing in the Matrix, which is you're telling people the world isn't what they think it is. And that it's, it's almost like telling someone that when you're 30 that you're adopted. It's like you could, you know, it's like, okay, you know, you, you're just like, no, no, no. And then all of a sudden, if it clicks just for a second, they get really, really angry. It's kind of, um, and, and think of this also, we grow up with the globe in our classroom. It's literally in your classroom from the time you're six years old up until, you know, if you graduate from high school, it's 12 years, 12 years of conditioning. The CIA pays good money for that sort of conditioning, 12 years. And if you're thinking, well, that doesn't make much difference really, because the flag is also in the corner of our classroom and 12 years of that. And a lot of people join the military based on the flag reinforcement. They're willing to die for that flag. Well, why? Because, well, we live there. That's, that's what we stand for. What's the difference between the flag and the globe? Not much. Uh, and so as far as sci scientists getting, you know, coming down, I mean, I've seen too many things. When Neil Tyson comes out and says that uh, science is right, whether or not you believe in it, <laughs> science is true, whether or not you believe in it. Sorry, I mean, we, we've run into that so many times. There's a certain arrogance when you get up at a certain educational level, especially in the physical sciences. They just don't want to talk about it. And so we've been just tearing it up based on attrition, the plain, plain and simple. Um, so that, so as far as can we bridge the gap? We're trying, we're, we're trying and you know, stuff that you're doing right now. Hey, great. Wonderful. You know, uh, it, it, maybe it helps, maybe it doesn't, 
but it's okay. You know, what I try to tell our members is, look, it doesn't matter who's coming at you because we all used to be on that side of the fence. And usually, the so the short version would be empathy. <laughs> You, you, want to, you want to try to bridge the gap, you want to see less hostility, find empathy, which means put yourself in the other person's shoes and understand just for a second what they're doing and where they're coming from. And that will help a, a great deal rather than just saying, oh, that person's stupid, that person's a retard, blah, blah, blah. I've heard it many times. Um, let me get into, do you want me, do you want me to address um, Nathan Thompson first? You want me to do Mad Mike or both? Uh, I'll talk about the the Mad Mike one uh, at later, a you want me to later do Nathan question. I think yeah, yeah, and it doesn't have to be specifically him. I'm no, sure no, no, he's that's just, fine. No, I I found out the same way you did. I read the headlines. You know, Nathan and I don't talk on a daily basis, uh, and he is a very enthusiastic street activist. I mean, I've done some street activism in various places, but not nearly what he is. He's fearless in that regards. He initially made his headlines because he he tracked down a NASA employee that was at a Starbucks. And just was yelling yeah. at him. And it's like, well, dude, what are you doing? But then, yeah, and then the he, he kind of crashed the Raleigh conference. And that's how, you know, he got really, you know, situated in the, in the documentary. And we've been, I've been kind of looking for a, an interesting place, you know, to, to use. He's got a certain skill set. Do I think he was right in uh, <laughs> trying to yell flatter slogans to grade school kids? <laughs> probably not. No, I mean, that that's probably out of bounds. But at the same time, the line gets blurred because I've had junior high schools interview me, you know, unsolicited, where they called me. In fact, I just did a, a prep school in Los Angeles just a couple of days ago. I mean, I'm not, I'm not going on campus to do it. They're usually done like this, but it does happen. And so, you know, like any family, we have funny cousins <laughs> and he's he's one of those guys. So. Yeah, sure. All right, I'm going to do one more question before I open it up to anyone from the, from sure, the sure, audience. Sure. This is one that we briefly touched on since uh, you got to see the questions. That um, one of the things that I find the most surprising yeah. across the board is significant disbelief in NASA as a huge organization. Right. That NASA is full of thousands and thousands of individuals right. who uh, have gone through fairly similar education paths, but they are all still individual people yep. and that for flat earthers have to look at all of those thousands of people and say no uh that it kind of segues into the part with um the name mike hughes that you know nasa has so many employees because they do some pretty intense things that require a lot of experts and a lot right. of work and right, a lot right, of right. time Whereas one man, Mike Hughes, tried to single-handedly nearly, I don't know too much about his story, but he tried to say, I'm going to build a rocket myself. Right. I'm going to go up. I'm going to look for the curvature of the Earth. Uh, I'm going to see if it's there or not. And if anyone here is not aware, I know I didn't bring up in my presentation earlier, but he died recently. I think it was in the last month. Oh, last, actually, not even two weeks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, less than two weeks ago. He died in an accident related to a launch of one of his self-made rockets. Yeah. And so this kind of ties back into the NASA thing that NASA needs that many employees because they're trying to do some incredible things. Right. And no one person can be NASA. Right. So if a flat earth community were to amass the technical skill and expertise and put together an, a, an organization that launched their own rockets, would that become untrustworthy inherently based on its size? Like if people who claim to be flat earthers went up there and said, nope, it's curved. Would you believe them or would you think that something suspicious is going on? Uh, well, it's kind of a weird question, but I'll, I'll answer it the best I can uh, because there's multiple things in this question. Um, okay. the, the first off is there's never going to be another Flat Earth rocket program <laughs> besides the one that Mad, Mad Mike Hughes did. Um, yes, NASA, of course, has to have tons and tons of people working on their stuff. And by the way, for those people that may have the question, it's like, you're saying that everybody in NASA is in on it. And it's like, no, 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 The only guys that would need to know would be the telemetry guys. Everybody else that turns wrenches, that builds fuel systems, that builds capsules, and so on and so on and so on. They don't know anything. I mean, it's just military compartmentalization. However, going back to the Mad Mike Hughes thing, because I want to clarify this, because I've, I've got everything on Mad Mike Hughes, but I don't want to spend like half an hour doing it. Um, mm -hmm. Mad Mike approaches, he was a, he was a daredevil first, and he right. approached us back in 2017. In fact, he was supposed to be in the documentary, as a matter of fact. But the producers, because it was a, it was you know a, a low budget production, they were worried that if they, in fact, they were worried. They said, "Well, what if he flies and dies?" 
you know, what happens? You know, do we have to cut them out of the movie? Does it change the whole tone of the movie? So they decide to not do that. And he ended up getting his own documentary called Rocket Man, which was really interesting. Mm -hmm. So he, he came to us in 2017 as a daredevil. And he said, hey, could you give, you know, do a crowdfunding thing and get, give me some money to finish the rocket? And we said, okay, well, in exchange, we'll put a big flat earth sticker on the side and you guys, you can be fun. And it was the best $8,000 we ever spent. He generated a whole bunch of headlines. He launched and, you know, everyone, everything was great. But Flat Earth was not his top priority. His top priority, okay. it, it was girls, money, <laughs> fame, and then maybe Flat Earth. In fact, he was really surprised at how much media was coming to him. And they were asking him Flat Earth questions. He didn't know how to answer them because he wasn't really a Flat Earther. So he, you know, did his thing. And then eventually he got on uh, Tosh.0, got the documentary, and then signed a TV deal with um, the Science Channel called Homemade Astronauts. And they were the ones, they were the ones that uh, told TMZ they were on site. The reason why he was launching was because they were doing, a th he was doing a thing for the Science Channel. Anyway, the point was we didn't recommend it, but he was a daredevil first. It's like, hey, look, you go have fun with that. Okay. And it's like, but remember, he's a daredevil. We go watch daredevils jump motorcycles and jump cars and do all this because there's a chance something really horrible could happen. Let's let's call it what it is. And something did bad happen. The parachute fell off and, you know, he crashed. So and he wasn't exactly loved in the community because of this you know he was always about you know it's my glory it's my fame you guys can go which is why he wasn't in the documentary mm -hmm. that being said to your point and, and then we can get to whatever whatever you got in the audience which is um would would is there something that uh, we could do the, with the space program that we would trust right for example we don't need to build a rocket to do you want to give us convincing evidence Give us, put a 4K camera, any 4K camera. I mean, you get them in a freaking box of cereal nowadays. Put it on the top of a capsule of any rocket that's going to leave the Earth and leave orbit. And, show, you know, turn it on. Do not turn it off. Let it point at the ground and let the Earth turn into a wonderful ball. And that's it. And, and make sure we can analyze the footage. It's never happened in the history of space travel. Statistically impossible, but it's true. It's it's never ever happened. The you know it's always put on the first stage or the second stage, and then it falls off and tumbles and, and dies. And there's always huge amounts of editing. Um, the other thing that you could do, and you don't even need a rocket. If you want to prove to me that that space is real, show me how a spacesuit works. And I don't care about the uh, the oxygen or the nitrogen or the heating or the cooling or the CO2 scrubbers and any of that other stuff. Tell me how a spacesuit doesn't become a basketball because it defies thermodynamics, meaning pressure needs a container, period. Everything you put pressure into, whether it's a balloon or a, a basketball or whatever, needs a container. And a spacesuit defies all this. A spacesuit should turn into a parade float and it should burst and the guy should die. In fact, I'll give you a quick thing real quick and then we'll, we'll open it up, which is the, here's the, the bigger version. Let's say there was a, a floor above you right now and you turned it into a vacuum chamber. You put a cork in the ceiling. You pop that cork. What's going to happen? Any physics people in the audience, they know exactly what's going to happen. It's going to equalize instantly, violently. It's not like the movies where it's like, we've got two minutes of air left. Get the duct tape. No, no. It's instant, right? Well, the big question is, how did the air not stay in your room right now? Why did it go upstairs? Why didn't gravity keep the air in your room? You're saying, what's, what's your point? My point is, when you walk outside, how is everything still here? How is the atmosphere still here? If the giant vacuum chamber, which is space, didn't rip it off, how didn't it rip it off? Ask any scientist where the bleeding edge of space is. Sorry, I ramble, I get really excited. Anyway, that's it. What do you got? And to follow up on that point, yeah. I'm not an atmospheric scientist myself, but are you familiar with the process of off-gassing? Sure. Um, you know, that there are particles of atmosphere that are constantly leaving the Earth, but it's Says who? not at a rate that you would think due to the gradient and pressure I, over hundreds and hundreds of miles sure. and things like that. Again, tell me how the gas didn't stay in your room instead of go upstairs. And you guys think I'm kidding here. Look, there's wonderful videos. Look up a videos on YouTube called uh, Vacuum versus Steel Rail Car. The Germans love doing this. Take a steel freaking train car, apply a vacuum field to the inside. It just implodes like it was crushed by Godzilla instantly. So, and, and, if, and you think, of, well, no, gravity, gravity might win. It's like, no, if when you're taking a straw and sipping soda out of a glass, the small vacuum your mouth is creating is beating vacuum or beating gravity ever, every time. And that's a terrible example, but you know what I'm getting at. So yeah. anyway, sorry, yeah. go ahead. Sure. 
All right. Uh, okay, we got our first couple questions from the audience ready, I guess. Uh, if you go ahead and say it, I don't know if you'll be able to hear them, but I'll repeat it. If okay, you go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Did you hear that? No, he's really far back. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so the question is, is how does the flat earth model explain seasons, particularly with respect to southern hemisphere seasons being flipped from northern hemisphere, like Australia? Got it, got it, got it. Okay, so, and I, I know you've watched the movie, so you get the, the basic framework. So the moon and the sun are traveling over us in circular patterns like a mobile above a child's crib, but they're also like a needle on a record player. So the, you know, when the needle, you know, goes in and out, that's how part of the seasons work, plain and simple. And when it comes to the, the constellations, because people say that's probably the follow up question is like, okay, why are the constellations flipped on the, uh, the outer part? At the, we'll call it the outer rim versus the inner rim. Well, because you're looking at multiple projection systems. We're, I'm saying that part of this is mechanical and part of this is probably digital. The sky appears to be instanced. And for those developers that are in the audience, instanced means you can create the sky based on region. So both of you have, you have a friend in Australia and you were in the United States and you say, oh, hey, I'm looking at the belt of Orion. Oh, hey, I'm looking at the belt of Orion too. Only it's flipped or whatever you want to say. It's like, well, the belt of Orion has four stars in it. And I say, no, it's got three stars in it. Well, who's right? Well, you're probably both right because you're probably looking at different projections of the belt of Orion. The sky is just a projection system. That's plain and simple. You're, you're in a building, a planetarium. This is no different than that with walls and a floor and a ceiling. Okay. One thing that I kind of want to follow up on with that question myself um, yep. is kind of give seasons. You could pick uh, two points on, or, you know, on the same uh, longitude. I guess that would be so north south lined up with each other sure. uh, and you could Determine if they like you'd have to wait for good conditions for like nice clear days in both not many clouds But let's use for example uh, Like North and South America. I guess would probably work best for this example Sure. that you could say all right in North America. It's summer So yep. for this patch of North America the average temperature is 80 degrees at the exact same time in South America It's winter the average patch uh, here is 30 degrees. Sure do you feel, I don't know, you may have already done this, I'm not sure, but do you feel like you could then just try to directly calculate the distance to the sun? Because you could tell empirically by measuring with things like other heat sources, like candles, you could say, all right, here's how heat travels across distance. Right. So to get this temperature gradient, the sun has to be so many so much distance away. Right. Have you ever tried anything like that? I'm we, curious. I've we, never tried it myself. We have messed with it. The best we can tell, and of course we're, we're, we're just approximating here, is that the sun is, and I, I, I can't even remember if it was told, said this in the movie, the sun is very, very close and very, very, very small, which also would account for its setting because it's not setting, it's just going off into the distance. Uh, the sun would be like less than 50 miles wide, roughly, and maybe 3,000 miles high, give or take. That's what we're looking at. And by the way, the moon would also be about the same size and height, and it's also self-illuminated, which also was not talked about. There's so many things they left out, but I know they were condensing seven months of spending time with us down to 100 minutes. It was never going to be great. Um, you guys want to look up something fun, look up the, uh, the moonlight temperature test. You can do buy a point and click infrared thermometer or use copper strips or use predator vision, you know, with certain cameras. And what we're saying is that the moonlight is not reflecting. Moon is not reflecting the sun at all. It's self-illuminating and it's generating a cold laser light, which you can generate in any university up to 13 degrees cooler than the moon shade, which is the opposite of sunlight. So if it's 50 degrees in the moon shade, it's I'm sorry, 50 degrees in the moonlight. It's up to 63 in the moon shade. To explain that. Uh, how does that happen? Unless you can say that the radiation from the sun is being morphed into something cooler. Uh, and scientists usually freak out when we show them this. I and mean, there's some wonderful videos on that. Okay. All right, I'm going to move on to the next question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm going to try to... Yeah. I, that that was that. kind of long. By the way, you can have... I don't know what your setup is. You could always have them walk up there if you wanted to. 
Uh, sure, we'll try that for a future question. That's okay. probably much easier than me trying to remember the entire question. Yeah, well, what, 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 what uh, was she trying to? Yeah, so the question was regarding the idea that the CIA and public schools are all trying to tell people a certain idea, in this case, that the Earth is round. Sure. Uh, what is the end goal there? What? Why are they trying to say that? Oh, no, that's and, a good one. That's, that's like, a good does one. Does it tie into anything biblical? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so... Fair? One out of every 10 questions I get is along those lines, which is, why does it matter? What, what, what do they have to gain, you know, other than, you know, manufacturing globes? It's obviously the globe makers that are making the money. Um, no, yeah, it's, it's not what it is to gain. It's what you have to lose. Because what we're talking about here, again, was not talked about in the, the movie as much, is that even our best and brightest, even we didn't figure it out until about 1960. Meaning, remember, we've only had the, the internal combustion engine for, what, 100 years? And before that, we didn't have a lot. And so, you know, pl pressurized planes we even haven't even had for, what, 50, 60 years? Even ones that could fly above the weather? Not a long time. So if you didn't figure out until 1960, the United States and the Soviet Union didn't figure out until 1960 that we were living in a big box, a big cake box, basically, or a pizza box, because it's pretty shallow, then would you tell anybody? Would you tell the public? Uh, no. And there's a really short meeting around that. It goes something like this. Uh, what happens academically in your side of the fence? Um, remember, as, uh, astronomy and astrophysics, they get closed forever. They shut down overnight. They never reopen. And then biology, hydrology, archaeology, geology, and so on and so on and so on. They have to be retooled literally from the ground up. Libraries have to be emptied. Then that's every university in every state in every country. That's just academically. World markets, <laughs> you have to suspend world markets for a couple months to figure out what it means. I mean, good Lord, look what the virus has been doing to the markets over just a week. Don't tell me what this could do. This could shatter the markets. And then, of course, the big one, which is religion, which is you're, you're talking about the big five religious houses of the world, um, Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, and Christianity. You're asking them to show restraint and not take revenge against science that's been beating them over the head with textbooks for the last five centuries. That's a really, really short meeting when they say, oh, what's the worst that could happen? No, no. You're, if, if there's even a 5% chance that people will all of a sudden start rioting in the streets and, uh, you know, carrying fit, uh, pitchforks and torches, you don't do it. And but at the same time, you can't hide it forever. So, yes, the, the government agencies and CIA and NSA and FBI and, and Secret Service and all those guys, they, they, they came down to, OK, eventually we're going to have to release it. And eventually. But you're, the infrastructure has to be in place. And that's where we are right now. I mean, look at what we got. We have high speed Internet, social media, six billion smartphones More people have smartphones and running water. Now you can push it out which is what I think is happening. I mean, this thing's, we're, we're, I mean, yeah, I'm part, my group is doing part of the legwork, but we're getting almost no resistance out there. Hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, yeah, that's not so much to gain, it's to lose. Well, yeah, what, what do you have to lose? And people in power, yeah. there's one thing that they never, ever want to do is lose power. All right, all right. Uh, we're going to go ahead and have you come up. I guess that'll be yeah, easier. Yeah, come up, so come up so I can hear you. you who have questions want to come on up. I still got can... 20 minutes till you get thrown out. Yeah. Yeah. All right. By, you can by, either by the CIA, say hi, no or, less. Or you can just stand aside, whatever you want to do. Okay. Hi, Mark. Hi. Um, so I have a question regarding how the moon was formed. Da -da. Um, so in it's kind of a little bit more scientific than some of the previous questions. Sure. Um, so the leading theory for how the moon was formed was the giant impact hypothesis right. that there's a kind of a Mars-sized body called Theia. That collided with the Earth, yep. um, and then that created a lot of debris right. um, in this our gravity field. Um, and then, because of gravity, over time, um, all of this, all this debris and everything, kind of um, formed the Moon. And then we um, have the resulting Earth. Right. And there's a lot of evidence for this. Mm -hmm. um, the main one being that um, kind of the composition of the Moon, especially some of the isotope uh, isotopes like zinc. Um, compa when compared to the moon, to the Earth, are very similar. Right. Um, so I was just wondering what flat earthers, um, what their view is on how the moon was formed okay. um, and the scientific evidence and how that relates. Okay. Uh, I, will, I won't spend a lot of time on this. Uh, the short version is that the moon was just placed there. Uh, it is mechanical in nature, and it's basically just a decorative part of a giant clock system along with... The planets and the stars and the sun 
Uh, notable things about the moon, you, you probably know a, a lot already, but things that we notice, uh, for, for, forget about, you know, the fact that it lines up perfectly during eclipse would be why all the craters are set up at a 90 degree angle, which we love so much because if it did... What, is, do, you mean by, what do you mean set up at a 90 degree angle? Meaning all the craters are perfectly spherical in nature. They were hit at a 90 degree, everything came in at a 90 degree angle. There's no skid marks on the moon. It was almost like it was... There, there actually are um, some areas on the moon where you can see some craters and you can see that they're, um, they kind of do a sputtering effect. Um, and when you... There's actually some simulations um, of cratering that when you can... Um, you can kind of change them to a 45 degree angle right. and they still do create that circular. It doesn't have uh, to come in at 90 okay, degree Okay, okay. I'll go, I'll go to a different angle. So you absolutely believe 100% that the American military went to the moon from 1969 and left in 1972 and no one ever went back ever from any country. No other person or has ever set foot on the moon and that's absolutely legit above board, even though it's two generations from you at this point you believe this i know that okay uh then i mean i could i could throw up a thing on the screen but i'll send it to um uh, the host in which show me i mean oh God, there's so many things i could go on about the moon the moon footage has aged horribly over the last 50 years notably top three things i'm not even gonna count that no stars in the background because of exposure settings why all the shadows are going in multiple directions or there's no thrust even though it's a 10,000 thrust of engine or the satellite dish that they put on there which has a maximum vhf range of maybe 50 miles on a good day and that would be beaming morse code punch through a quarter million miles and with 10 frames of color video a second and two-way communications with pinpoint accuracy and no snow at all come on there's, the moon doesn't have an atmosphere, so there's no snow. But um, yeah, I guess that we kind of went off on a tangent there. Um, yeah, my original question. question. All right. Thanks. All righty. Go ahead. Hi. Hi. Um, what do you attribute to the rise of flat Earth? Is it the general distrust in governments? Is it people's lack of empathy for each other, like you were saying earlier? Right. And if it is general distrust, how can both sides come together to? kind of form a bond to find a similar goal the the big okay the big rise in flat earth has been mostly because of social media I, i'm going to call it what it is i mean it's not it's not a big secret here which is why youtube and google was brought up in front of congress a couple of years ago which didn't thrill me a whole bunch because they had to deal with the flat earth problem and fake news and all that other stuff social media the, the reason why flat earth has gotten as much push as it has is because because of because of so because of the cell phones mostly um people that that view cell phones and i'm not picking on your generation or or, or others but we give you give equal weight to some youtube creators that you also would a major network i mean i i've talked to kids who have said oh yeah five million subs instant credibility more credibility than this cnn journalist has been on there for 20 years and because of that you know all sorts of things are, are on the internet um but it's also a, it, the, the biggest reason why we spread the way we do is that we created an easier way to explain the solar system. The easier way to explain uh, uh, our model versus the solar system. That, that's basically it. Combine that with social media and you, you've got a, a pretty lethal mix because people love easy. Uh, not to quote uh, The Art of War too much, but there's a great quote which says, you know, people are like water. They always take the path of least resistance. I mean, you guys text, you don't talk on the phone because it's socially easier. We always take the easier path. Flat earth, you can't get much, much more simple than that. Um, as far as the, the hostility and the distrust, you know, how can we bridge the gap? I don't know. It'd be nice if we could find the, the, the bigger problem for science is they have so few social media scientists out there. I mean, you can count them literally on one hand. Ready? Here we go. Neil deGrasse Tyson, the most popular scientist in the world which he's not by even not even in the top 1000 as the best scientist in the world how's that work um brian cox out of the uk michio kaku and then that's it who else you got bill nye he's a freaking comedian out of seattle he's not even he's an actor and yet he gets on panels for like the mars rover and quantum physics how does that work anyway so there you go so what you're saying is you would like a scientist to approach you in a matter that would 
kind of put you on equal footing. Oh, yeah, a bo- g- giving you a friggin' body of scientists. I mean, Neil deGrasse Tyson said in an interview just three weeks ago, he said, he goes, I will not debate someone when I am absolutely right. <laughs> it's like, wow, really? And then I bring up from my speech, I'm sorry, and I don't want to burst anyone's bubble out there in the audience, but anytime somebody comes at me and says science is right no matter what, I, I say, fine, look up the coelacanth fish. And, and tell me about the coelacanth fish. Coelacanth fish, fossil record, dead, extinct, 70 million years ago. And every scientist in the world bet, would have bet the freaking farm on that. And then they caught one off of the beach of South Africa. And then another one off of Madagascar and Mozambique. And now National Geographic has a special with them. Well, the problem is this. It's like, yeah, they caught them in 1940. If that fish would have been a little more elusive, and they, no, no one would have believed it in 2000 or 2015. You know, we would have literally had to smack scientists in the face with it. So that's the problem. Science is only true until the day it's not. So when anyone, by the way, and I'm going to go off on a tangent here real quick. If anyone says, oh, there's no dinosaurs swimming around Loch Ness. Well, it's like, why? Well, because they've been dead for at least 100 million years. Really? So is that fish. There you go. Thank you, Mark. We're going to move on to the next one. Yep. Thank you. All righty. I'll grab my phone real quick. Go for it. Hi, Mark. Hello. Um, so obviously in the, uh, obviously documentary it kind of went over a few of um a few of the experiments you guys have trying um you guys have been performing yep um but but and and i understand that this was a seven month time frame like you said pushed into 100 minutes yep. but what i didn't see a lot of was the attempt to disprove past theories and past um processes uh from people such as uh, ptolemy or or sir isaac newton or you know Feynman or all these all these, you know, geniuses from the past, and what I what I don't see a lot of is right. is the the disproof, um, I guess, and and the the action to, to disprove first before you prove. Got it, got and it, I got just, it. Just um, on, on, right. No, no, I got you, I got you. Um, first off, the 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 director and the producers, they just didn't have time to dig into the old stuff. Uh, they they didn't they they weren't going to dig into sticks and shadows argument and the boats over going over the horizon. There just wasn't time to do it. In fact, it wasn't even supposed to be a nuts and bolts film at all. But when, again, it was supposed to be a human interest piece, literally. It, but once they got to that point where where the, the kid in the conference was asking me questions, that's when it changed. It was like, okay, but the movie was already done. I mean, they had already finished shooting and they didn't have enough money to go back. So it's like, okay, we're just going to tweak and we're, we're going to go after Jaron. We're going to go after Bob and you know a couple other shots here and there. Um, but as far as, yeah. Dis- sure. th- yeah, they couldn't cover it in the movie. As far as disproving the old wizards from back in the day, um, we don't, We most of the time we rely on the new stuff. I mean, 90% of our tests revolve around long distance photography, which of course they didn't have a, a long time ago. So again, sorry that you know that we they they wouldn't bring up the old stuff, but it probably wasn't going to play as well because I hate to say this because you guys are you know you're the learning generation you're you're in a classroom of people that want to learn, but the average person on the street the saying is pretty simple and that is we don't want to be we don't want to learn we want to be entertained, and so that's how they skewed the movie. And by the way, I had nothing to do with the production of this movie at all. I was merely the subject. Okay, thank you. Yeah, cool. Any questions? Thanks. So, in the documentary, at one point you juggle. I'm a juggler myself. How did you learn? And like, have you ever been part of a circus community? Wow, that is a wonderful question. And you know what? I have got. I have done hundreds of interviews, and no one has ever asked me that. Thank you for that. Um, I, I self-taught and it, in fact, I could teach people how to juggle and you probably could too. And that is oh, yeah. the, the trick is, and I, I, I practiced with like fruit, like apples and oranges, Same. Yeah, yeah, oranges yeah. The- which is the, the key is you, you, you throw one, one ball into one hand and throw the other one in the other. And you, you start with two. That's the whole thing. And once out. you can do two without thinking about it, that's just it. You know, you're watching TV, you're doing whatever you, as long as, long as you can do two, then third is just it just never stops and that's and that's it i've taught people how to juggle in all 10 minutes i've never done a circus troupe i can't do chainsaws i can't do flaming things i can't do i can't even do pins but uh but in fact i was really surprised they put that in there because i just had some globes that a friend had sent to me i get globes sent to me every once in a while and i was just and they're really it's really hard to do because those things are foam you really you know you like heavier stuff you know like hacky sacks oh, are yeah. great but those things were foam and they were lucky they even caught me because I was just, I was having a difficult. So thank you for that. A- anything else? 
Uh, just like a shout out for our city. Fayetteville's got two of the best jugglers in the world. Oh, right on. Really? Right on. I, and, cool. th- and by the way, thank you in advance for the University <laughs> of Arkansas for, for doing this. This was really, really awesome. Yeah. Ready? Yeah. Uh, hello there. Hello. Uh, I guess one of my questions has come from the documentary. So, something about this little funny animation of the book is about the flatter saying something about how it how to make a poop sandwich. How to make a poop sandwich. I was trying to be... Uh, yeah, okay. It is... Uh, I was trying to come up with different... I used, It started out with, like, the DVD on the shelf you're never going to watch. Somebody gave you. Uh, I, I, you guys probably don't even buy DVDs anymore. But when it comes to the book, it was, it was literally... What I was trying to get at was... Yeah, How to Make a Poop Sandwich, Volume 2. Which was... It, it, Flat Earth is the worst of all conspiracies. I could rattle off 20 different conspiracies. Yeah, but there's so many of them, and everybody in the conspiracy world knows about Flat Earth, and everybody hates it. Nobody wants to address it, ever, ever, ever. And then once you do, it's like, it was literally on my bucket list, because I'm older. And I looked at it, I was going, oh, I don't want to do it. But I had to. Why not? It's like, I, I'll just knock it out, and I'll say I was done, and I can die happy. Does that help? Yeah, but, and I guess my follow-up question onto that, just a little phrase, is like, was there any th- other, like, quote-unquote, how to make, a poop sandwich book that caught your eye and you continue to believe something like that? No, no. Um, I literally had an opinion. If you can think of a conspiracy, I literally had a con- an opinion on every conspiracy. I mean, I, I don't consider myself a tin hat guy, like I said in the film, but I, I could say, oh yeah, okay. Do you know, again, I know there's some things you can't talk about in universities. 9-11, pro- you know, probably a thumbs up for me. Did Elvis have Bigfoot's baby? Probably not. So, and then there's everything in between. So, no, I've lo- I looked at, at literally everything else. Um, no other conspiracy really caught me off guard. No other conspiracy surprised me. In fact, I got into it. They didn't talk about this in the documentary. I got into Flat Earth w- by looking at Hollow Earth. That's how I got into it because I was looking at um, uh, Hollow Earth theory and uh, there was uh, the Admiral Richard Byrd, the United States Navy. And I fought, he was in part, part of the Hollow Earth Theory. And then I was going, oh, he must have spent all his time at the North Pole. And it turns out he spent 30 years in Antarctica flying around. And that's what got me down on the road. It was, it's an amazing, it's an amazing rabbit hole. Cool. Cool. Yeah, thank you. Very much. Yep. We got one more from the audience. And then I think I'm just going to try to keep asking you another question too until we basically. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I have two questions and they're unrelated. Sure. One is, what is the dome made out of? Got- and two is, how do I find a flat earth community near me? Ah, well, okay. Um, the, what is the dome made out of? Really, really good question because whatever it is, and I know get, they also didn't talk about it in the, the documentary, the United States and the Soviet Union tried to bust through it for four years from uh, 58 to 62. That's uh, every, look it up. It's called high altitude nuclear explosions. And literally all the atomic weapons, the test for four years were straight up. That's all they did. So what can stop atomic weapons? <sighs> uh, heavy elements, heavy water, electromagnetic field, unified field, some sort of high frequency thing. I don't know, but whatever it is, it's beat our best. And I mean, literally after the first few shots, because our first few shots were like low megaton, and then we were firing mid-range kilotons for, you know, another three years, and we couldn't get past it. Uh, as far as anyone in in the in your area, and there there, there are. As a matter of fact, I was interviewed by a, a class at this university um, some time ago. So I know there's people out there. Um, I'll tell you what. Email me. You know, my channel is literally called Mark Sargent. Can't miss it. Uh, but the um, there's a playlist there called Flat Earth Meetup Promos. And you can look in there, and there's a big list of you know hundreds of cities that have that have done uh, meetups. And by all means, you know, look through that. And if you still can't find anything that you like, I will send you the contact info for the group if I can find it. Uh, the class that, in fact, it wasn't even that long ago. It was maybe four or five months ago from Arkansas. I'll send it to you. Okay, thank you. Yep. Thanks. Right. We have one more from the audience who just came up. Okay. Hi. Hi. Um, in the documentary, they mentioned that they use the scientific method to prove flat earth theories, right. how you have a hypothesis and then you test it multiple times and then you come to your conclusion. Yep. Test, observe, repeat. So do you consider what you guys are doing science or not science? Because you keep saying that science is fake, but you're using the scientific oh, method. Oh, that's a tough question. Um, 
here's the thing, because I've had multiple people, in fact, the CBS thing that came out this morning, you know, he asked me again, it's like, do you hate science? Are you anti-science? I was like, no, I, I love science. I'm a tech guy. I worked in the tech support field for 20 years. Um, do we consider ourselves scientists? Yeah. Well, obviously not certified and not officially, no. But at the same time, do we believe in the scientific method? Of course. The scientific method, you know, test, observe, repeat. Anybody, I mean, heck, even rednecks out in the middle of nowhere, you know, when they're jumping their, their RV over a swimming pool, you know, that's technically, you know, it's like, well, if we get enough gas, you know, eventually we'll get over it. You know, eventually, technically, that's a really bad scientific method. So are, do I consider myself a scientist? Not really, but at the same time, we are trying to reinvent some of it. We we are trying to rediscover. And, and let me let me let me end it with this. I have learned so many stupid little scientific, actual scientific factoids in this journey. I have I have learned and memorized so many things about physics and engineering and chemistry and biology and all this stuff. Just just in the journey, that if anything, this going and getting into the flat Earth helps you understand more about science. How's that? Okay, thank you. Yep. Thanks for seeing All right, so my next question that I had is kind of actually a perfect follow-up from that, so that's really nicely timed. <laughs> uh, but this is going off of what I would call like the two dangling pieces of evidence from the uh, from the documentary. Sure. The uh, laser meter stick experiment from Jaron Campanella. And, uh, and, then and the, the ring laser gyro, yeah. Yes, yeah, those two. Okay. That those were, as I think, uh, what she was just asking about, those were really trying to get it like the scientific method yep. of saying we've got this idea. How can we test this? How can we collect data and test it and all that yep. stuff? And the way that they left it off on both cases yep. seemed to point strongly towards a curved Earth. Yep. So I was wondering Why if we? you knew if there were any, uh, if there were any follow-ups to those oh, experiments God, and how yes. those... Oh, hell yes. Yeah. Okay, first off, the, the shot they took it, you know, people, people have asked me, because I went to film festivals when this before this thing was picked up by Netflix and iTunes and, and Amazon and all the others. Um, I went to some of the film festivals and the, people asked me, it's like, would you change anything about the documentary? And I say, I'd only change one thing and that's the shot they took it at Jaron at the end because it was unfair. However, Jaron did botch that experiment horribly. What most people didn't know, you know, because he did it twice. You know, he did it once and they, they flew back up to the Bay Area, San Francisco, to, to shoot it again. And the first time, like, he melted the laser condenser. People don't know that if you have a high, you know, military-grade laser, you can't just leave it on. If you leave it on, eventually you're just going to fry it. You know, the, the lenses, which is why they had that huge, huge pattern on the, on the side of it. Um, because lasers, even your uh, point and click, and I don't know if anyone's got one in the in the in the classroom there, but uh, like even a point. Oh, there you go. Even that will <laughs> spread uh, two feet per mile. So um, mm -hmm. so Jaron didn't even have line of sight, and he didn't he didn't even check it. So but the short version is he went live without even. It's like well we'll just do it live on camera for our first thing. It's like what could go wrong? It's like what are you kidding? And we didn't know that until after the documentary came out. He never even looked at the site during the daytime. He just went to Google Earth and said, "Oh, this this seems to be flat." It's like, "Didn't you even go and check to see if you had line of sight, you know, of of, of anything?" It's like, "No, he didn't." So, but again, remember, the editor yeah. hate, hated us. As far as the ring laser, I, mean, I would assume that's why he did it by water because you know water's going to sit flat. So, if you can find somewhere where you have stagnant still water, like obviously the best situation is you put the post in the water then because right. then you know it's good right right which is why and we'll get to the follow-up here in a second um the ring laser let's go back to the ring laser gyro and then we'll do the, the more laser stuff because we actually just acquired uh, a forty thousand uh, dollar ring laser gyro just recently uh, i found that out today but the ring laser gyro the big question is and you guys and some of the people in the audience may know but a lot of people that you know in the film festivals and the people that saw it in the theaters did not know this which is okay what's moving us or the sky that's really what it comes down to is the is the is the ring laser gyro picking up the movement of what's happening up there or is it picking up the movement of the ground yes it was picking up a 15 degree per hour shift but is that shift happening in the sky or is it happening on the ground? We say it's happening in the sky. You guys might say it's happening on the ground. Who's right? Um, to be decided. But let's go back to the, to the laser thing really quick. Because there was a follow-up laser experiment, which, again, the film team didn't cover, partially because they didn't want to fly over to freaking Hungary to do it. 
uh, wonderful videos on it. Uh, Lake Balaton. We even had Guinness Book of World Records with us. F near Frozen Lake, we shot, I think, 40 kilometers over that thing with, with a really high-end military laser, and we hit we hit the target multiple times. We can do it all day long. In fact, and through that, we started using mirrors to shoot stuff through the haze. Remember, because what you're breathing in here is only about 99% transparent. Um, even during daylight tests, we can use mirror during the days over bodies of water. So yeah, we had tons of follow-up tests. But again, the director, the director has never talked to me since. The producers have, the editors have, the director. Oh my God, he burned so many bridges, which I feel bad for because he was a really nice guy. But then, you know, it's, yeah, he just got grumpy. So sure. what else you got? Well, I think that uh, kind of going back to the uh, ring laser gyroscope right. that I want to bring up is one thing that you mentioned earlier is that part of what is, uh, I'm trying to think of the right word, part of the thing that makes the flat earth model attractive is its simplicity. Yep. Uh, are you familiar with the idea of an old, old astronomy concept called epicycles? No. Okay. So epicycles are no longer supported in science at all, but it was this idea um, from, I believe it was part of the... Uh, uh, geocentric model, so when it was believed that Earth was the center of the solar system and that everything was going around Earth, that occasionally you would see planets move in weird ways, like retrograde. Right, right, right. Mercury right, right. Moving right. Retrograde. Yep. And so the way that uh, astronomers hundreds of years ago would explain that is they'd say, okay, well, instead of the planets going in a perfect circle, there's actually a circle on top of the bigger circle, and they're going around on that little circle. Yep. And so they would calculate, and they would still say, mm, I'm off by 1%, and they would add another circle on top of that, and eventually they needed 57 circles to explain the orbit of Jupiter, yeah. and those circles are called epicycles. Yeah, I've seen some of these diagrams. Yeah. Right, and so that was one of the big, big things that was in support of Kepler's idea of ellipses, right. that if you put it on an ellipse instead of a circle, it's perfect, easy, and it's much simpler than 47 epicycles. Right. And so... Going back to the ring laser gyroscope, right. if your claim is that the flat Earth model is simple, I find that that doesn't coincide with what we've discussed so far tonight, because with 15 degrees per hour, yeah. 15 degrees per hour explains the sun, the sky, the constellations, everything. Sure. Solidly 15 degrees per hour, yeah. whereas if you need the flat Earth model, you need 15 degrees per hour for the heaven energy as it was it talked about in the movie you need a separate amount of degrees per hour for the sun based on the seasons as we talked about you need something separate for the constellations as we talked about sure. so do you want to talk about anything oh yeah, yeah, it yeah. Like no i mean using it, its simplicity most of it is simple of course there's going to be some things that aren't as simple but at the same time the sun and the moon flying overhead doesn't need much l let me break it down a little easier and that is in the solar system model you need geometry and trigonometry and calculus and quantum mechanics and so on and so on. For the flat earth model, you don't need really much at all because you, you were talking about a very, very small space and just lights in the sky. So engineering wise, it's very, very simple. We do this now. That's the part that, again, I, I know I'm dating myself. You guys don't even, do you even have a planetarium in Arkansas? <laughs> <laughs> Well, you yes. know, what I'm saying is plant, yeah. plant, people used to go to planetariums and smoke weed and lie on their backs and watch things. Uh, you know, usually they do rock concerts and laser lights shows and stuff like that. But we're talking about basically that's that's the version we're talking about here is just a planetarium, which is look, it's just a projection up there. But but to your point, it's a projection with the whole intent of creating the solar system illusion. And that was, and again, we didn't talk about it in the documentary because there wasn't time, which was eventually civiliz all civilizations have potential of figuring out where they are. So what you really want to do is make sure they don't look at the fence. Remember, if you want to look up some fun stuff, look up ancient cosmologies. And I know you guys say, well, the ancient cosmologies are outdated, but that's what everybody drew. Everybody drew the same thing. And I don't care about the Greeks. Let's not even get into that. Everybody else drew the same freaking thing, which was some sort of snow globe. And that was, well, you can't have that go on forever because sooner or later, if you have enough technology like planes and internal combustion engine, people are going to start looking for the edge. They're going to start looking for the fence. So eventually you've got to get rid of that. So whoever built this place, I don't care if, you're, if you, you think it's a deity or an advanced civilization, it really doesn't matter. But you've got to get rid of the fence. You've got to make it invisible, which means you have to create the illusion of space. 
And that was done very, very well, you know, and, and science went along with it. It was it was flawless to where even the, the powers that be didn't figure it out until 1960. <laughs> that? I think. The question is who, uh, where's this projector coming from and who's projecting oh, it? Oh, it's, think... it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not front screen technology. It's probably, again, do, do I have all the details in this? No. And even if I did, I probably couldn't tell you, which is, look, we didn't even have HD televisions 20 years ago. Yeah. I know you guys probably don't realize that 20 years ago when you were born, we didn't have HD TV. So, yeah. and we, we have what 4k borderline on 8k now. So imagine if you had million K televisions or million K projection systems, whatever's up there is really good. In fact, I like to call it um, Mandelbrot projection systems, meaning you wouldn't even have to make the resolution on them that great until the technology of the surface civilization gets up to the point where they can detect it. So if they have really crappy televisions, uh, just leave it low res, you're fine. And then as they, their technology ramps up, you ramp up whatever's happening in the sky. And by the way, okay. as far as how high the ceiling is, pff, again, maybe 3,000 miles, maybe less. But that's not much of a stretch because 95% of our civilization lives between sea level and one mile up. P uh, commercial planes cap out at 10 miles, maybe. And spy planes cap out at 20 miles. So you don't need much of a ceiling at all. Technically, you could keep everything in here in less than 100 miles if you wanted to. Okay. Um, I think we're going to have a couple more questions. Like I said, we're going to probably just go as long as we can. I don't know how soon somebody's going to come, but okay. in the back. That's a very open-ended question. What is <laughs> the question it? Is, is there anything else that the government has taught us wrong? Oh, good Lord. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. Sort of no, no, no I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you one. In fact, I'll get, it's from my book and I'll give you one that you guys probably haven't even heard of. I mean, I'm not going to go into 9-11 or Pearl Harbor, every American war. I mean, look, powers, power, there are conspiracies in this world. People lie to protect their own interests. And everyone here in this audience, for you, nobody's naive enough to believe it doesn't exist. People lie. Look, it happens in business and politics and sports and entertainment and even journalism and science. And you say, well, no, science is, oh, come on. Science cuts corners and does stuff for money all time, all day long. Lead paint, lead gasoline, DDT, uh, and all versions of DDT, uh, asbestos. Oh, how about the tab big tobacco? We could go on and on. But um, let me let me give you one real quick. One you guys never heard of. You can look it up yourself. I absolutely take exclusive rights to this, and that is the Panama Canal. You're saying Panama Canal is not a conspiracy. I go, yeah, it is. Here's why. Um, big engineering projects, people die every once in a while. They fall off trucks. They get thrown into cement. They usually fall, right? So the Hoover Dam, I think they lost 70 people making the Hoover Dam. Kind of a big deal. You know how many people, and, and compared to that, remember the Panama Canal is just a big ditch, right? It's just a big, long ditch. So you know how many people died in making the Panama Canal? Better part of 6,000. And you're saying, wow, that's pretty good. And then I come, and then you watch, everyone will nod. I'll say, well, yeah, but they died of malaria and yellow fever. It's like, well, of course, you know, mosquitoes, that's fine. It's the cost of doing business. And I go, yeah, but what if the United States government knew they were going to lose that many men? It's like, well, how could they know? They didn't know. It's like, yeah, they did, because the French were the ones that started the Panama Canal. Most people don't know that. And they lost so many guys, they had to quit. They lost 21,000 men to the point where Paris was rioting. <laughs> and it's like, no, stop sending our sons to this place. And they quit, and they put down their shovels and the machinery, and they were done. And the Americans stepped in. It's like, yeah, you know what? Let's, let's finish this thing. We could lose up to 10,000 people. Where's the conspiracy? The conspiracy is, here's a general, general conspiracy, and that is when someone's getting recruited to go down to Panama to do this, do you tell them there's a one in eight chance you're going to die? No, you do not. You just make them sign on the dotted line and you send them. And that is, do the ends justify the means? And that's what most conspiracies are born from. Do the ends justify the means? Which is goes into your empathy thing. Let's circle back all the way to the beginning. Which is, I don't hate government <laughs> at all. Sometimes government makes decisions because they think the ends are going to justify the means. And they're not going to ask the general public because they're, they're, they don't want the debate. They don't want, they're going to make decisions that you can't. And sometimes I agree with them and sometimes I don't. Panama Canal, absolutely agree. Can you put a price on human life? Yes, you can. You think I'm kidding? Look at the giant, well, one more real quick and we'll go to another question, which is um, look at the, the giant real estate scam that we did, which was the Alamo, close to where you guys are, right? Texas, how did Texas even get formed? You sacrificed the Alamo, 200 guys. 
America goes to war with Mexico. What do we get out of the deal? For 200 guys, we got Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, because there used to be an old Mexico, and that worthless state of real estate called California. Trillions of dollars in real estate for 200 guys. So again, do the ends justify the means? Sometimes they do. There you go. So just to be clear for myself, uh, you're not denying, of course, like the existence of the Alamo or the existence of the Panama Canal. You're saying that there were calculated, there's calculated loss of human Pe life. People in saying. power make decisions, bigger decisions than what the, the general, but what you don't know won't hurt you. They make decisions okay. what, for what they consider to be the greater good. If it benefits the empire, if it benefits civilization, they're going to make those moves. All right. We got one more question, and then I think we are actually going to have to wrap okay, up for real. Okay, one more question. This is it. Last question. <laughs> okay, so my question What's your shirt? I want to see this. Wait, what's your shirt? A, I'll tilt it a little bit. Star Wars at an arcade. Nice. Nice. Just That's for awesome. Reference. And by the way, uh, I stopped watching Star Wars after The Last Jedi because it freaking broke the franchise in half over its knee. There you go. <laughs> When you said you could outgeek anyone in the room, this guy was shaking his head now. Oh, no, I absolutely can, man. But we won't have that discussion right now. Well, actually, with you, since you're wearing that shirt, I probably couldn't. <laughs> but I also have two Star Wars tattoos. <laughs> oh, my God. Hyperspace weapons? Gas cages? No. No, no, no. No, no. Anyway, what's your question? So my question is in regards to the dome. So you said that there was a projection on the outside. Could be on the inside. Uh, I'm just... Could... Or, or, I'm just curious what your thought is on what is outside of the dome. That's a great. Because that's you a, kept you mentioned you mentioned the Truman Show quite a bit. Yeah, and I was just curious what your thoughts are is outside. That's of a the perfect dome. ending question. Okay, stay here for it. Okay, so my, what I think is outside the dome because I don't get asked this a lot is do I think first off is this a one off? No, I don't. And I also don't think that we're, we're the first people to rent this apartment, not by a long shot. Um, so inside the dome, you know, our civilization, unbroken history, maybe 5,000 years. But we all know there's stuff out there we don't know, you know, that, that don't make sense. The sunken cities off of Japan, the sunken cities off of India, the Bosnian pyramids, Bimini Road, the real pyramids. You ever, ever get a chance to go, go and stare at it and tell me how the hell Cairo people made that. Never happened. Um, but as far as what's outside it, I'd like to think that it is an unlimited universe. So think about this world. I'll, I'll, I'll slow down just for a second, which is this world is made up of 99% conflict. It's almost inescapable. It doesn't matter how rich, how beautiful, how powerful, how talented you are. There is always something to complain about here. You're always worried about something. Right? Even, even Kanye has stuff to complain about. It's the most arrogant man ever. Uh, so if that's the case, if we're living in a, in a conflict world, then whatever's out, I believe in dualism which is for, you know, you, you can't understand pain without pleasure, hot without cold, and so on and so on. And if this world is 99% conflict, then I think what is outside of here is 100 or 99% unlimited. And in fact, I think I'll take it one step further. I think the reason we're here is because we had to gain perspective. We had to remember what it was like to suffer. You know, to just take a line from the Matrix. Human beings tend to define the reality through misery and suffering. That's where we are. We all suffer and we all learn from it. This doesn't feel like an entertainment system. It doesn't feel like a prison. It feels like a school, which is ironic because you guys are a school within a school and so on and so on. But that's what it feels like. And what I think once we're done here, we go back to what you know, the unlimited universe. And we're there for a while. And I, you know, after, who knows? Maybe after a certain amount of time, we come back just to gain perspective. So that's what I think. Okay. Okay. Cool. Well, like I said, we are going to actually end up there since we're a little bit past. Okay. Uh, thank you for sharing your time with us. No, thank you. Uh, yeah. And I think that everybody got to learn some plenty of good stuff. Let's give <laughs> Mark Sargent a hand. Thanks guys. Thanks. And again, don't, you know, don't, I'm not here to con uh, convince you. I'm not here to persuade you. I'm just here to throw out a few ideas into your head. If you wake up every morning and think that life is great and awesome and, you know, big thumbs up, uh, then don't look at flat earth. Don't do it. Because if you look at it, it uh, it'll suck you in like the La Brea tar pits. All right. Well, thank you again for your time right, thanks, and I hope you have a good rest of your evening. All right. See you guys. Bye. Bye-bye.